Captain. Today's guest is um, retired Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens, uh, formerly of the U United States Air Force. Uh, Steve, as he likes to be called, uh, seems to be in some very unusual things, and uh, let's find out how you first got into it. When did you first get involved studying things such as ex extraterrestrials and, and uh, reported sightings of UFOs? Well, I got interested in UFOs as a phenomenon in about in 1947 when I was working in Alaska on an assignment. I had been working in the Air Technical Intelligence Center at Wright Field where one of my jobs was sorting the technical material that came back from factories uh, captured at the end of the war. And we were looking for new aero-technical developments and uh, we were Abs we're collecting the data, separating the data, screening it and taking it out, and it would be translated and abstracted for industry. Industry would brief us on what they were doing and what they wanted us to look for. Then we would go brief them on what we were finding and ask for new guidance. And so I was pretty much current on all the latest aero-technical developments in the world at the time. And about that time I was assigned to a Anchorage Air Force Base in Alaska, actually then it was Anchorage, uh, it was Elmendorf Army Air Station. And uh, they, the Air Force had just achieved a degree of independence, so I went up there as an Air Force officer. There were only three of us there as Air Force officers on an Army base, which was strange because I, I had to fly with the Army for my flying time. Uh, the, I, I later figured there was, there was a reason for sending me up there that it was based on my experience in the Air Technical Center, Intelligence Center, because when I got up there I found that one of my main jobs was briefing and debriefing the crews of a research project called the Tarmogen Project, a weather reconnaissance project. This was an unclassified project that had some classified riders on it and my job was to oversee the classified riders uh, they involved installing some very special equipment aboard the mapping airplanes and taking the equipment back out again at the end of the mission and taking the cartridges of uh, film out and the cassettes of tape out of the devices, packing them in a metal box and shipping them to Washington every night chained to an officer's wrist. They were couriered out. Uh, the Tarmogen project consisted of uh, a weather research project where the combat-ready B-29 crews from, from Strategic Air Command were rotated to Alaska. All of our crews were different. They, they would, they, they, this was a combined research project and a training exercise. All of these crews had targets over the pole, and they were giving polar, being given polar experience. They were also helping develop polar intelligence, and the, they would be rotated to Elmendorf, field where we would install the equipment, brief them, assign a grid pattern, they'd go out and fly it, come back and tell us what happened. On several of these flights, or on a number of them, uh, an average probably two a month, they came, the crews came back reporting contact with strange circular aircraft in the, vicin in the polar vicinity. At first, uh, we thought that the, it was a new Russian development in aircraft. And I think that may be why I was sent up there is because I knew what the Russians were doing. I knew what they had and I knew what their industry was capable of. Uh, and I began to debrief the crews and hear these stories of these disc-shaped craft flying at speeds of thousands of miles an hour, which we couldn't do at the time, and they didn't burn up. And stopping and standing still in the air and hovering, and th there were reports of them approaching head-on a bomber flying at, say, 250 or 300 miles an hour, they'd approach head-on, stop, reverse course, and pick up the speed of the bomber instantly, like that. And these, these were truly strange uh, characteristics for airplanes. We, they clearly indicated a, a technology beyond the capability of Earth at the time. There were even reports of them sitting on the snow cap, sitting in the Arctic water, submerging beneath the water, emerging and flying away and sometimes they saw formations of them, sometimes they saw them as streaks in the sky. At the same time that they were able to photograph these things, they were able to record 
the electrical disturbances aboard the aircraft because they were already doing this in connection with the other research. So at that time, we gem generated both photographs, electrical disturbance recordings, visual recordings, uh, movies, and everything else of these devices incident to other programs. But this intelligence was important because uh, it clearly told us that what we were watching were not Russian technical aircraft, not Russian developments, that it's something else. And uh, I think that's really uh, where the big effort in, in government research on UFOs began was in, in the 1945 on. They picked up a lot of information from the Foo Fighters during the war that uh, at first we thought they were enemy, an enemy development, but that was, the war ended in 45, and this is two years later, and the, the things are still there. And so I think that, that a lot of things were happening then, and that's when I got interested in UFOs, is because of the unique nature of these aircraft that couldn't have been produced by Earth technology. I began my own research then. I never got to see any of the pictures taken, never got to hear any of the tapes, never got to see any reports on the data because it's a one-way street. It, I was collecting an intelligence that it goes up and it doesn't come back down again. All they do is tell us something new to adjust, another way to, 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 to look for, for data. A new co a piece of equipment would arrive to be installed on the B-29s to look for other things. Emission scanners that would scan the whole spectrum looking for radio emissions that we weren't weren't producing and the Russians weren't producing and we did pick up some but I never got to see what happened or what they did with the data. So, since you began investigating how often do these uh, contacts seem to be made? I mean is it you on mean, a fi fairly regular basis? That on a worldwide basis? Yes. I, I would say that there are contacts daily on a worldwide basis. Yes. Uh, in Right here in our area where we, we have uh, a measure of local activity. We average uh, a dozen good contacts a year, but they wouldn't they wouldn't spread out one a month. They they come in groups. They're concentrated, but that's just Tucson. When I look at Seattle, they, they have about the same rate, but it's the timing is different. The grouping is different. If I look at Buenos Aires, Argentina, they've got about the same rate. So I've got to believe that that the contact some place on the earth, surface of the earth is at least daily and maybe more frequently than that and that a lot of work is being done by a lot of extraterrestrial intelligence. I think that uh, the average number of cases reported worldwide today is something like 80 a week you know that gets in the hands of UFO study groups and organizations that is reported to authorities and that's uh, quite a bit of an increase. I remember a time on maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when it was five a week. That's the growth is, is substantial. It's been a steady growth, mm -hmm. a steady increase. So we are being observed more now than we were before and on an increasing scale. You feel that, it's, that we're being observed more or that it's being reported more? Well, both. It's being reported more also because it's getting more attention and uh, because there are more agencies collecting the data. The more places to report it. But at least we're developing more information. I am not sure, I agree with you, I'm not sure that it isn't all in the reporting. But there seems to be an increase in the collection of data, rate of collection of data. Do you have to do with uh, the, our potential of self-destruction getting more eminent also? I think, yeah, I, I think that uh, we're, we're approaching more crisis points and uh, become, we, we, we become uh, interesting laboratory experiments to extraterrestrials. We are at, a, at the point of over polluting our earth and changing the, the, the life on the earth because of the acid rain, the uh, amount of industrial pollution in the air, the destruction of the ionosphere by uh, industrial pollution, and uh, overpopulation, the misuse of the atomic bomb. There are a lot of reasons that get seem to get worse and worse all the time and they seem to be concerned about how we handle these crises. If they're not handled, if any of them get out of control, they're going to be destructive. Population can, lack of population control can can make the earth in, uninhabitable. The same thing with atomic weapons, same with pollution, any of those things. And we're at a stage now where we should have begun correcting it 
before this to get it under control again. Does it seem that there's a greater concentration in any one area of the world than another? Uh, the only increase in concentration I see is where there's more eyes looking up and more cameras to record. Does it seem more in the country than in the cities? No. Mm. Uh, there, there are more reports from, from congested areas, but there's more eyes looking up. Uh, there are a lot of reports from the country areas, and I, I would say that uh, there is more activity over remote areas than there is city areas, even though they get, we get re more reports from city areas. Because if you look at the ratio of reporting to population, it, uh, the cities aren't, they don't occupy the, the, the densest point on that scale. If you do it that way, the, then remote areas seem to have the greater concentration of activity. Do you know, is there one, any government that seems conducive to, um, to researching these in a way that's going to benefit humanity rather than the particular government itself? Well, the French government has established an official government UFO investigative agency, GPAN, G-E-P-A-N. Uh, it's funded by the government, it's staffed by scientists, and they have a budget to investigate cases and develop the data on. Uh, I think that they're making progress. I think that we have such programs active here, but it's not public. Mm -hmm. They don't make any information public. I think our research is probably more advanced than theirs, but not on a public basis. From what you know, how long have these extraterrestrials been visiting Earth? I mean, well, it's, it's, the seems, indication it seems to me is than 47. No, the indication to me is that they've been here throughout all recorded history and that uh, we're just becoming more aware of them. There probably is no substantial increase in rate either. They probably have been a lot of visitations. Uh, in earlier historical times, we didn't have the media to carry the information, so everything was local. But we did have a lot of local reports that were quite spectacular. If you remember in the 1400s, uh, three uh, cosmonauts got out of a spacecraft in France uh, near Lyon, I think it was, they were taken to the Bishop of Abelard who ordered them stoned because they were strangers, intruders in the area. Hmm. Tell me, uh, it seems like, say, starting with 1961, Betty and Bonnie Hill, um, they were sort of examined mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to some later cases where they seem more conversant with the people. Is it because they were different extraterrestrial types or just that they've progressed to a point where now they now they've, they feel they've learned enough and they're conversing? Well first of all remember there was quite a bit of communication that took place between uh, at least Betty Hill and the occupants of that spacecraft. They uh, gave her an escorted tour about the ship, they showed her a navigational chart and they explained how they navigated in space. They showed her uh, routes frequently traveled and less traveled and seldom traveled. They showed her, uh, she wanted to know where we were uh, or where they came from on the chart. And they said, uh, do you know where your son is? And she said, no. They said, what good would it do to, for us to point out where we came from then? So then he pointed out, here is your son down here. And he said, we come from here and we have these routes to travel. But there was quite a bit of communication that took place in the short time they were aboard. But, you know, she says they also put a needle into her abdomen that they apparently were checking their mouth since mm -hmm. um, they checked Barney and, mm -hmm. and wanted to know why his teeth his teeth out. out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, it, now what about, you know, we hear also about cattle mutilations. Are those uh, experiments on animals? Or? I don't know. Uh, up until just a f uh, probably a few months ago, we didn't have any clear indication that there was any relationship between cattle mutilations and UFOs. We had UFOs reported in the vicinity, strange lights and strange craft, and cattle mutilations taking place in the vicinity about the same time. But we didn't have any clear evidence that they were connected. Then uh, APRO received a report of a group of people that had staked out an area where cattle were being mutilated over in New Mexico and they succeeded in photographing a UFO in the air at, at within hours of a, a mutilated animal. Then 
I understand just within the last few days they have received indication that a an abductee, a person taken aboard a spacecraft, had seen a cow being dissected above that uh, aboard. I, it, it's new information. I don't know any more than that. Uh, it it is now the first connection that we have, though, if that's true and if that report is valid, it's the first reliable connection we have between UFOs and cattle mutilations. It could be a form of them studying radiation effects and pollution effects on, on a life form. Yeah, it, it, it could be anything. Could yeah. be anything. <clears throat> Tell me, of all the cases you've examined, say percentage-wise, which do you, what percentage do you feel is really uh, pretty well substantiated, substantiated how valid percentage-wise? Well, of the ones that I've looked at, where I've been able to uh, look the people in the eye, Talk to them personally. Talk to the witnesses. Go look at the sites. Go look at the evidence, the landing marks if they exist, and anything else. So sometimes there's dead animals and, and damage to foliage. Uh, of about 200 cases, I think, that I've looked at personally in detail, I would say that about 80% of them are, I would consider, valid. That really happened. The other 20% might have something... Uh, either the person has stretched his story or something that leads to unreliability of information and that the percentage of real ones might be higher than that but I'm convinced that at least 80 percent of the ones that I've looked at are are valid I know that other researchers say that it's the other way around maybe 20 percent but then maybe we're looking at different cases and maybe we're picking our cases differently uh, I think that a high de high percentage of them are really, really happening. I see the changes in the lives of the people. I see evidence that can be examined and tested. And I believe that the percentage is high. I'd like to mention a few things and just give me your feeling on them. Uh, 1947, the Flying Saucer in New Mexico. Uh, we've had some, feed, some indications that that is valid. The landing near Aztec you're talking about. Uh, one of the indications we've had was a report from one of the two Indian boys that were riding horses in the area that found the crash saucer on the ground with bodies out of it. They rode back to the local uh, mission uh, missionary there, parish missionary. He was a Catholic priest. His name was Father Fox. He was assigned in the area. They told him and he uh, put his equipment in his Jeep and followed him back to the wreck. There were bodies apparently dead there. He administered the last rites of the Catholic Church to the bodies, covered them, and got back in his jeep and went back to the, to the church, the parish church, where he called the sheriff's department. The sheriff took a couple of deputies and they went out and looked and decided that it was something that the Air Force should handle. And they went back and called the Air Force, and I believe they called the office at Alamogordo. The Air Force, they described what they'd seen. The Air Force sent in uh, air police troops to cordon off the to close off the area then they went in with uh, equipment and they photographed the object on the ground from all angles and everything then they loaded it onto a large flatbed truck and made up a convoy of vehicles and hauled it out of there we got a uh, report from a, a now retired master sergeant who was then a three-stripe sergeant said that he was taken from guard duty someplace and and assigned to this new guard duty uh, where he was first briefed that he wasn't to look at anything unnecessarily he was to, to keep the area clear and he did see a large object a large what it looked like a large circular object loaded on a flatbed truck tilted at an angle to get it on there covered with canvas and he said that it was the load was too big that they had to they couldn't go under bridges they had to go around so they had equipment to do this and he uh, remained with it for a, a day and then he was relieved and sent back to his base after being sworn to secrecy and told that it was a national security project and that sort of thing and uh, uh, and that's the last he heard of it but he was replaced by other guards who came on the scene at a point our belief is that each that those guards escorted the convoy a ways maybe a day and they were relieved and replaced by others we think that these guards may have been drawn each group from a different base from the vicinity so that they didn't know each other they couldn't match points that the ones that loaded the object observed the loading didn't know where it was going those that escorted in in between didn't know where it come from or where it was going and those on the receiving end didn't know where it came from it was a in a matter of keeping the the, the whole 
Project Secret. Well, we do believe that there's enough evidence now that that happened, although we don't have any pieces of the craft or anything. That one apparently was taken to Wright Field. All right. Uh, Travis Walton. <coughs> What can you, uh, lap? you know, I understand that when he was picked up, that apparently he saw more than one type of being. One he describes as the, the shorter, uh, smooth, gray skin, as I, as I yeah. remember he described them. Yeah, there, there are three general classifications of, of saucer occupants, that, and they break into about thirds. The first third of occupants seen in, in UFO contact cases uh, look human-like. They're much like us, and if we put western clothes on and they probably could walk our streets undetected. Then there's another major grouping of smaller creatures that have lighter skin, sometimes pasty white, that have uh, a different kind of development. They, they don't have any eyebrows or eyelashes or hair on their heads. They don't have any hair on their bodies, not on their arms or anything. Their skin apparently doesn't even have hair follicles in it. And the skin is different. The skin is, is, is a, a different texture and it's much lighter. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to ask you to, to uh, 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 talk to Martin about that in a minute here. Let's let's right, go on though, and and come back because he's just been doing some studying on those on the, those creatures. The third type would be uh, a, a miscellaneous category that includes creatures that are covered with hair, some with long hair, some with short hair, some with exoskeletons, some with uh, uh, very soft, uh, um, pulpy bodies. Uh, some are very small. Some are very large. Some are are just different shapes uh, and you could lump the rest of them into that but there seems to be a lot of different kinds of entities involved in or, uh, coming aboard UFOs and studying our society. Billy Meyer. Billy Meyer's case is unique in the, the case that's happening in Switzerland in the sense that the uh, it's unique because the amount of information that's generated there. He has taken a lot of good, clear photographs that we can analyze very carefully. That we've never haven't been able to do this with the fuzzy, moving shapes, you know, and then the, the lights in the sky at night don't lend themselves to proper analysis. These uh, disc-shaped, structured objects in the sky, below the horizon, in front of clouds, through clouds, that have been taken by Bailey Meyer lend themselves to computer analysis in a peculiar, a particular way, and we can study them in greater detail. Uh, we have more of them also. We have, uh, in, his, in the case from Switzerland, we have metal specimens, four different metal specimens we're studying, and they're unique. We have recorded sounds of the spacecraft that we're studying. It's unique. Uh, couldn't be duplicated on Earth. The metals uh, show, uh, I guess you could sum up by saying that they appear to be precipitated from primary matter to the dense stage of density they want by some cold con condensation process done in a vacuum. And that's something we can't do here. You know, uh, we, hear, we hear reports occasionally about the ships themselves being organic, somewhat attuned to the pilots that are um, controlling them. Have you heard any stories along that line? Anything well, that might there's, be there seems, to an extent? Yeah, there seems to be some evidence of that, but in, in the Swiss case, again, we find probably the best corroboration for that. The aliens themselves have explained that the central part of their computer is an organic component. It's, it's a, a grown organic component because the organic component can rationalize better than, than inert materials can, mm -hmm. uh, chemical materials. And because it has an organic component, which is a... Uh, you might call it a cloned brain. It's 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 tissue cells per grown to a spec particular specification for use in a computer. But because it's tissue cells, and because tissue cells are animate material, they uh, they can communicate with the computer telepathically and get answers back telepathically uh, through the organic component. So now they say that they and they've demonstrated this, that they can get out of the ship and leave the ship empty. All the, all the people can get out. They can send the ship away telepathically, leave it on station someplace, and call it back telepathically when they want to re reboard it and, and go away. Now that's interesting because that, that's a slight extension of technology to do that. A slight. <laughs> well, <laughs> more than we can do, but not more than they can do. <laughs> right. uh, tell me, uh, 
Have they given any indication as to their particular lifespan? Yes, they say that in their controlled environment, artificially produced aboard their spacecraft, where they have no air pollution, they have no cosmic radiation filtering through, they have uh, pure water and the foods are, are processed to the degree that they eliminate a lot of, of bulk. Their, their foods are more nutritious and, they, and less of it. And the water the same way. They enjoy, because of these ideal controlled conditions, they enjoy lifespans of from 800 to 1,000 years. Now, they're relieved of the stresses of our society also because they have no economic system. They have no political system. They have no orders or order of rank and precedence. None of the things that stress us. They have in their relationship between the sexes almost equal parity. And they, uh, they, they don't have bills to pay. They don't have pressures. So they, they enjoy long lifespans because the conditions are ideal. They say that when they're here on the surface of the earth and exposed to our conditions that their lifespans are shortened for the time that they're exposed to a degree. And they do experience some difficulty. However, they can get out of the spacecraft, breathe our atmosphere. It does, in time, affect the nasal. Uh, it affects the sinuses and makes their eyes water. But they can, they can handle two, three hours out of the spacecraft without resorting to environmental gear. <clears throat> Have they given an indication of what they subsist on? Is it similar to the type of food we might eat? Yeah, they, they, ha they grow it. Uh, or provi produce it all aboard the mothership, but they have gardens there. They, they raise vegetables and fruits. They also produce uh, protein uh, foodstuffs uh, at, at lower orders like algae and, and uh, lower order things. Uh, they don't raise meat animals like we do. Uh, they don't produce, they don't have cattle, they don't have meat of that kind. They see that Earth humanity is still requires a certain amount of animal protein. And although they say that we're going to grow away from it, we, they observe that we eat meat. I don't think that they eat meat. Uh, have they, do you know of them actually saying that we require it or that we can do with it? Or? Well, they, we've gone through a stage that required it. We should, be going, we should have grown out of it by now and we're slow in doing so. Uh, we need what we need to meet the requirements of our society. Uh, uh, laborers working underground in coal mines and doing heavy labor require, wouldn't have been able to survive strictly on nutritional food. They, right. they required that, uh, a certain amount of protein, animal protein. Too. Uh, hmm. Tell heavily. me, how many, how many contacts has Willie Meyer had? He had his 130th contact while I was there two weeks ago. He, uh, he observed, though, that they, those are the official contacts. Those are the ones that he was allowed to make notes on. He's had another 28 contacts that he, where the information imparted was of a personal nature to him or the group or information on future developments that he was not allowed to record or uh, even the, to record the meeting. He was told not to, and he observes their requirements. So he, in fact, has had more than 130 contacts, but he has had 130 that he's published or has prepared notes from. And that's since January of 75? So that's since January of 1975. Uh, when he has contacts with them, he knows ahead of time that they're coming or they just show up? Uh, no, he gets, uh, he gets a telepathic advisory beforehand. He usually has a, an hour or two to prepare. And uh, his preparation is kind of a ritual too. He, he takes a bath and changes all of his clothes inside and out. Brushes out his beard, combs his hair, puts on a clean shirt. Uh, uh, gets his pistol, dumps all the cartridges out, checks the pistol over, puts the cartridges back in again, puts it in the holster, checks it in the holster, buckles that on, then he gets his, his uh, walkie-talkie radio, he dumps the batteries out, puts fresh batteries in it, checks it with both base stations, puts it around his neck, puts on his jacket, and then he gets the signal that it's time. He may wait a half an hour or an hour this way. And then when he gets the signal to go, he goes out and gets on his moped and drives off. They lead him to the contact point. The hmm. pistol is for his protection from the earth people. Yeah, the pistol is, it, 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 he's found that the, the dangerous ones really are the earth people. He's been shot at. While I was there, I witnessed the seventh assassination attempt on his life. 
But after the first one, he bought a pistol and learned to use it. He's, he's one arm, but he learned to quick draw the pistol and he has practiced and can now hold a half a dollar on the back of his only hand, turn the hand, tip the half dollar off, draw the pistol and shoot it before it hits the ground. <laughs> Tell me, and he's accurate. Have you, you said you were there during his last contact. Hmm. Have you? No, there, yeah, you, right. Have you actually seen any of the... Um, I haven't seen any of, of the contacts. Uh, I I did one time see uh, something that struck me as very strange, and this was the time before when I was there. Uh, it was, he got his indication about six o'clock in the afternoon that uh, a contact would take place, and he prepared himself, and he was in the kitchen. I believe Elsie was there at the time. I, I've never discussed this with her, but uh, he, he got the signal to go, and it had been raining all day, and the ground outside is porous, but it had it's fairly level and had, it was soft on the top down to about three quarters of an inch and you'd make, make tracks in the ground up to maybe a half an inch deep. And it had been raining and there's water standing in little flat puddles all over the place. And he, this day his wife put a, a, one of those blue Air Force jackets on him that would shed water because he was going out in the rain. He didn't wear anything on his head. But anyway, he got the signal to go when I was at the far end of the table and he went out the kitchen door and I ran around the table and down to go follow him out. But they had a big dog chained at the steps that ran out to his chain and scared me a minute. And I went around him and out the door in time to see the door at the end of the shed. There's a long shed in, from the kitchen door to outside. And I saw the door at the end of the shed close. So I know he just went through it. And I ran to the door and jerked it open and he's gone. <laughs> And in the mud were about three or four footprints went out that far and there was water still running in, filling them up from the puddles around there and little drops bouncing in them. And I didn't see any more and I looked around the house this way and that way and no sign of him. So I don't know where he went or how, but which brings us to how he gets aboard the spacecraft. At first, they would land the spacecraft and he would go aboard through a doorway, a port. Then. That happened for a number of contacts. Then there was a change in procedure. They did not land the ship. They hovered it above the trees and they'd turn on a beam of light. And he would go up the beam of light to get aboard. Then there was another change. The, a time came when they wanted to take him aboard from a remote distance and they simply beamed him aboard from where he was. And that can be done from inside of a building, in the basement of the house, in a car, anything, where he just blinks out and is gone. He's aboard the spaceship, comes back the same way. and. All of these have departures and returns have been observed by one or more of the various members of the group around him in Switzerland there. Hmm. Are there many people that, there, how, how big a farm is this that he's on? The farm is about, it's 10 acres, isn't it, Elsie? Mm -hmm. How big, how many hectares? A uh, hectare, uh, 20. About, 20? Yeah, 20 hectares. 20 hectares, that's about 12 acres, yeah. About 12, so that's, that's not really a large farm. Are the people, Oh, uh, how, oh no, what I meant as yeah. far as area, so that, uh, you know, it, it's not so large that people on another adjoining area couldn't see what's happening. Yeah, but he has, uh, he has military compound on, uh, on one side and the other side drops away down into a deep valley, which is somebody else's property at the bottom. Well, the bottom is yours, isn't it? Uh, in fact, uh, the landing track, uh, one landing took place in the valley just below the house and they photographed the development of those landing tracks for a year, watching uh -huh. the change in the vegetation and so forth. Elsie, why don't you join us now, please? We'll just... There we are. Thank you, dear. Yeah. Okay, Elsie is, is one of the yeah. regular members of the group, has been there for a long time. Uh, for th she's been there for three years. She lives on the property with the other permanent members of the, the group around Billy Meyer observing and recording and keeping track of what's going on. Oh yes, I, uh, on about three years, I know now Billy Meyer. And um, when I heard about those uh, UFO, UFO uh, uh, activities, 
I was not uh, really interested in all that. I have never seen before. I heard about um, about flying saucers, but that was all. But then I heard that those uh, people, those aliens coming from uh, the Pleiadians, were giving Billy uh, teaching. And th in this stuff, I really was interested. Interested. That's why I now about about uh, in November, last November, left school just to start to study the whole stuff because it is a big stuff to of teaching. Mm -hmm. So I'm just studying yet, and I'm not just uh, well. I can tell a few things, but. Uh, uh, what do you feel you cannot tell John? Well, yes. <laughs> well, but I mean, uh, there is so much, would be so much to say. But uh, in one point, this, they are telling him uh, uh, what people already know. They have to look better after the earth. They should um, not... Um, uh, the chemical stuff, all the water is going to be poisoned. They are uh, the um, all those uh, gases and uh, the um, uh, atom. Uh, what do you call atom? Atomic bombs. Atomic yeah. bombs and all that. That's very wrong. And all also um, we are having too many people living here. Overpopulation. Yes, overpopulation about eight times. Uh, that on on the planet era, it's just. They have only so many people as the planet is able to to carry, and it's limited there. They uh, yes, control the limited. population to yes, that yes. level. And only this, uh, they have been telling Billy, and Billy has put this o on a paper and sent it to different governments, but people don't take any notice. Uh, why have they been coming here? Oh, uh, oh, there there are different. Uh, oh, they have come. Uh, the Lurian, Luranians, they, they are our forebearers. Yes, forebearers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, they have come here 22 millions ago, the first time, and then the earth wasn't developed, I mean the human races. And then they came again and came again and came again, and then they started to live here and to have children here, and then there were, were fights and wars and the scientists made a mess, and then some of the Luranians uh, were running away, but the others still uh, were staying, and f many of people living here are uh, uh, descendants, descendants, descendants of, the of the Luranians, and they feel uh, familiar to us, so they are coming to look at us. And uh, they, that's why they try to, oh, in the be beginning they came as uh, gods mm -hmm. and then they were uh, very um, uh, like a despot mm -hmm. and keep earthly people little. And now they are more developed and they think that's not the way to do it. Now they start teaching. We have to do the work. Uh, they are giving us information and then we are we have to develop uh, we have to do the work by ourselves so ourselves have they made any specific suggestions uh, along lines we could follow how we could could uh, really improve any steps we could take well by thinking by thinking by changing our way of thinking. really think about everything uh, think about the nature think about our relationship think about ourselves uh, really knowing that we are having a spirit ourselves and that we are able to de develop our spirit so that we are becoming uh, more developed and more developed uh, just like mm -hmm. those two yeah they say that we use uh, they tell these people that we use a very small part of our available brain capacity, that uh, it's wasteful not to use the rest, and we should learn to think more productively and reason and use the mind to do the things that we should do to evolve our world. Well, that sounds like we should be getting a lot more into parapsychological, so-called parapsychological things. Uh, well, the fact that they communicate with telepathy uh, would seem to indicate 
Uh, well, they also uh, articulate the conversation. These these Pleiadians do. They seem pretty articulate as far as several Earth languages are concerned. Well, this contact team has learned the language of the area. In one month. In one month. Same year, other huh? teams mm -hmm. uh, learn other language, languages of other areas. They say that they can learn any language of any time of the Earth in a matter of a month. Uh -huh. They have mechanical procedures for uh, doing this. And they are, and the other ones, they don't uh, have learned the language. They are having transmitters. Oh, yeah, they, they also have thought trans Just thought uh, uh, thought uh, converters uh, that uh, convert uh, thoughts to the language. When you say the others, are these all pl Pleiadians? I mean the Pleiadians, because Billy is having contact with the Pleiadians, uh, physical contact. Uh, uh, but there are other aliens. You've just heard it from. Uh, uh, say. Other, when you say the uh, Lemurians, uh -huh. the Pleiadians the were Pleiadians. descendants of the Lemurians? No, no, not Lemurians. No, Lurians no. is oh, what Lurians. you say. They're beings Sorry. that come oh. from the direction uh, of Lyra. Those oh, right. are our, our grand, 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 grandfathers. Right. The Lurians. Lure, oh. Lurians. Lurians, yes. Right. And uh, we are uh, familiar with the uh, Pleiadians. Yeah, the Lurians are also the ancestors of the Pleiadians. Yes, and that's why mm -hmm. they have started thinking more deeply a long time before the earthly people. They are having peace already at the planet era uh, 50,000 years, no war. And I think if we try hard, one day it is, a, it is possible that we don't have any more war. And that, I think, would be a step forward too. Tell me, how much has all of this activity affected your area where you live? As far as uh, socially, uh, the the way the neighbors have reacted, are they for it or against it? Um, oh, some of them are listening, thinking, and accepting, and many of them, they just say, oh no, that can't be. Very superstitious, and <laughs> they, they don't want the disturbance in the area. Oh. Uh, have you had Have you had much resistance from the government there? Well, resistance, yes, in a way, but they just, uh, they just, uh, they don't come and try to listen. They stand apart. And what? They don't want, at this time, they don't want to have to do anything with it. Uh, in, uh, no, in contrary, if somebody is going to tell them, we have seen something, they notice it, they put it down, they say, we haven't seen mm -hmm. after, we mm -hmm. haven't heard. Mm -hmm. They are not, um, they are still a little, uh, oh, not too sure. They think, oh, uh, we will wait until we are having more information. You, you've seen <laughs> some actual si uh, si uh, landings? I have not seen a landing. I have not seen a craft in the daytime, but I have seen it, in it coming I have seen it several times night at night. I s once Semiasa came, and uh, well, we didn't know then. It was only a li like a little star coming along, and another star on the sky at Mitriti, and then they came like that. And then uh, they turned, and the funny thing was the other one, other one went with. And they turned again. And then we were ran running inside to get Billy to ask what is going on on the sky. Mm. Then he came out and he stands beside to find out. Then he had an information by telepathy. And then he said, yes, it is Semyaza and Menara. They are giving you a show. Eight times they will fly and then they leave. So we were counting one, two, mm -hmm. three, four. And after the eighth one, they went off. All right. Uh, and I saw it also once coming along when it came like a star and suddenly it went so big, orange, red. Mm -hmm. And then I heard a noise of an aeroplane and you couldn't see anything more. Blinked out. But then Billy came, looked at me and then he just did what you have been telling, went inside, get ready for a contact. Mm -hmm. And then I could see him uh, walking around the house behind and nothing mm -hmm. then, but I then after I could see that star flying away again and then after uh, about an hour or uh, uh, we had to find or half an hour we had to go and Jacobus perching I had to go and get him far away yes Jim, 
Could you give us a brief background of Billy Maya, his age, his, his, his educational background, either or both of you? Well, uh, Billy Meyer um, went to a normal school, but his uh, most important teaching he has he had from um, the aliens uh, when he was about boy about five, six, six. Um, he uh, Svath came along in an old craft. Yeah, More Spoth like arrived in a cylinder-shaped craft that landed on end and on three legs, tripod legs. A door opened and he got out and, and introduced and met Billy. He also told Billy at the time that he was the voice that Billy was hearing in his head, identifying himself as the telepathic voices that Billy had been hearing. Took him aboard the spacecraft and took him out into space for about an hour and talked about many things. Brought him back and told him that the teachings would continue, the, the, the telepathic communications where uh, he expanded the knowledge of this young boy well beyond the knowledge of his contemporaries in school. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, he became disinterested in the, in the studies in the school because they were so easy and he quit going to school also because he was a very poor boy and the other boys would taunt him and they would make him the, the, uh, uh, the butt of their jokes. They would play pranks and make it look like Billy was the res one responsible and the teachers would punish Billy. But I, that happened when I, in my school when I was a kid, so I know how this works. And uh, at, Billy tried to tell them the truth, but they were more willing and prepared to listen to the other boys from the wealthier families. And Billy usually ended up being punished anyway for something he didn't do. At first he felt bad about this, then he began to think that that uh, uh, he began to think that the teachers were really stupid, not being able to see through these things, and he began to take a kind of a uh, secret, um, in his own mind he thought that they must not be as smart as him, because he knew, and they didn't, and they couldn't seem to see through it. It was a, a kind of, he accepted the punishment because he thought if they don't know any better, they don't know any better. And he thought, and, and really it was in, in one thing, it made, it eventually made the boys that were doing this feel guilty. Later on they felt very guilty about it. But so he was, it was an interesting play on, on status. Oh yes, and he had to learn a lot. I mean, I, I just know that he had to uh, learn um, 11 million symbols, it sounds. Uh, for, through the symbols? Palladium? Yes, and, but it, that's only one thing. 11 million? Yes, 50,000 uh, fundamental symbols, but mm -hmm. then um, changing. Yes, because he had to learn all that because of this uh, communication in telepathy. He mm -hmm. had to study. A long time, and uh, uh, after that time, after Svart uh, left him, then Asket came to look after him and to, f uh, t when he went in the east, Asket she was... Is female. Mm -hmm. that female. Female, that is a female, yes. Um, she came and was talking to him and gave him more knowledge about the whole world and about the universe and all, all what we don't know. So, uh, when she left, he had to do on his own about also 11 years, just everything on his own. And then, and 1975, same year as I came, and that's really when the mission starts was starting, when a few people were interested in Switzerland about UFOs and then a little group uh, started to uh, discuss those things. Yes. Have they given any indication why they have not made themselves more widely known? Uh, do they feel that would either cause a problem or, or why are they not more widely seen by people? You know, in, in large groups Maybe people would begin to listen then. Well, they tried to do it once, but then they uh, analyzed the people they uh, would like to come, and then they found out that many of those people would so be so scared that, and many of them would just... Shoot. Yes. Uh, 
we are not ready yet. Uh, at least in Switzerland, maybe that you uh -huh. are ready here. That no, might be. Would probably react that even could more be. So, yeah. But uh, so we just are looking forward that it w will at one time happen. They, you don't know of any specifics they've given to help evolve people outside of looking toward nature and simplifying. Uh, I, don't, I didn't get uh, any uh, specific. <laughs> have they have they given any particular kind of preparation we should be making to uh, progress to the point where there will be more contact with well, more people? as more as we know about them, as more they seem to us more like brothers. And uh, there are groups making angel out of them, mm -hmm. but they are really a uh, human being like we, only a little more, a uh, 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 big more, <laughs> and developed. That's all. And as soon as we recognize that they are pilots on a craft coming through the universe, just uh, l l um, staying here, then we uh, don't uh, will start those silly things to shoot or to be frightened. And, and also, uh, they, they are our thoughts. We usually uh, are thinking without any control. We are sending out thoughts uncontrolled, like this, like that, like that. And that they are not used to. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for them. They get a little uh, nervous. Uh, so that's why we before have to learn to control our thoughts, to think in a neutral way. And as soon as we uh, are able to control our thoughts, mm -hmm. then the communicator the communication will start. Most of us think destructively or avariciously. We want to acquire something, we want something to possess something, or we want to destroy it. Uh, we don't have organized proper thoughts. And this frightens them a bit because uh, the, all of these things are, are uh, apparent to them simultaneously in the thought patterns. Their thought patterns are organized. They know what they're thinking and where they're going and what the objectives are. Excuse Martin, would you join us please? Yeah, he's, he's got some information. He's done quite a bit of study on alien creatures. Stay. Stay. Alien, oh, well, we'll alien beings. Um, that will be interesting. Okay. Please. You're putting this on Martin because... All right. Right. Elsie, please. Oh. <laughs> now it would be pretty cozy. Martin, tell me, what is your background? I, you mentioned earlier parapsychology and... Uh, yes, I've been studying parapsychology for uh, about the last five years. Uh, I've been working here at the university and also up at uh, uh, the University of Utah and the University of Oregon at Eugene. And what have you come up, how, how have you tied in, uh, how have you come to, to see a connection between uh, extraterrestrials and parapsychology? Um, I really haven't, <laughs> but uh, uh, there is possibly is a connection uh, that, uh, that many of the, uh, uh, the unexplained events in uh, parapsychology uh, that, uh, say for instance, leaving the body or a person that uh, is capable of moving dishes and things like this could, and this is of course experimental, could have had uh, some of the uh, the genes or what have you from ah. the uh, the back uh, going back to uh, you know say 5,000 years ago of these people. That's why there's some people that are more prone to be psychic, telepathic, telekinesis than others. Um, and since there are about a thousand different types of genes, uh, some of these, that's one uh, particular research theory. And um, Martin has just, has just been uh, doing a review of the available uh, information on uh, analyses of alien uh, beings. Most of this is not available publicly. He's working inside of the organizations. Ask him to describe 
uh, a typical alien being and what we what was found in the pathological examination of the body. Oh, that's interesting because you know you hear occasionally about about examinations being done, but you don't hear much about results that have come from. Oh uh, yes, uh, well it's been uh, quite a while, and some of the doctors and what have you, and technicians that have done some of these things have, uh, of course, had to sign uh, uh, security releases, like uh, Mr. Stevens has told you. Uh, when you sign a specific thing about a specific autopsy, you can't reveal that or you can be held uh, supposedly under the National Security Act. Uh, well, anyways, uh, some of the, uh, uh, let's see, some of the autopsies that were done back in uh, 56 uh, on some of these uh, crashes and also in 58 and in 60, some of the um, autopsy reports have been filtered out through some of the retired doctors and what have you that are no longer involved and uh, on some of the humanoids uh, the uh, four foot uh, three foot humanoids uh, some interesting things have been found uh, one is that they have uh, no internal digestive system in other words they've taken no food whatsoever uh, they have uh, no uh, no uh, genitalias or any orifics uh, for uh, food. And uh, also um, their mouth is uh, just a slit and there's just a little um, hole or what have you about uh, so big in there and uh, that's it. And there's uh, many theories that they could be uh, genetic clones uh, like uh, <clears throat> biological robots that can be grown in some type of uh, uh, catalyst and then do the work of uh, whoever uh, the, uh, their masters are and uh, also on uh, several of their of the autopsies it revealed that uh, the blood or what we would call blood is a clear type of fluid and it had uh, similar to our blood with electrolytes and white blood cells. Uh, it had no red blood cells. And um, on one report, it's uh, been shown that uh, uh, type O positive was the blood type of uh, one of these uh, humanoids. It wasn't a standard blood type, though? Uh, no, well, O positive is... It's the closest uh, they could classify it, but it didn't have red cells. Well, I meant... It have they found O positive consistently among No, no, this is one, one uh, this is one peculiar instance that they've had. So have they has any autopsy work been done on beings that seem to resemble what we would consider human like? Yes, uh, from the information that I've gathered and uh, from several other sources that have been working on it that the uh, there are humanoids uh, that have had uh, autopsies done on them that are just quite similar to us. Um, uh, some have had no teeth, others uh, have the exact same organs that we do, and uh, there's a uh, slight irregularity in the skin pigment, and also uh, the uh, cell structure, uh, which is uh, still hasn't been uh, done uh, by electron microscope or scan electron microscope because uh, the pathological specimens, from what I understand, are under a general category of specimen unknown and, uh, and just a number. And they're supposedly uh, at the uh, pathological, uh, the, uh, well, either the Smithsonian Institute of Pathology or the Walter Reed Institute of Pathology and also the Air Force Institute of Pathology. Uh, have, from what I understand, samples, but they're not classified as uh, alien being samples. They're classified as samples unknown with a number. Mm. The, the ones that have no teeth, uh, if I remember correctly now, have either a monotooth or a bony ridge in there that takes the place of the teeth. So apparently they, the, the ones with the bony ridge must ingest something. Uh, probably not at all if they don't have well, the indigenous... In that same grouping are the ones that uh, apparently have a different excretory system. They have no anus, for instance. Uh, they, 
they have no, their ingestive system is very underdeveloped. A weak chin, a very small mouth, and no teeth, or just a bony yeah, ridge. That could indicate lack of. Uh, now, the the fact that those that were found without genitalia seems to indicate that it could be made possibly a form of a clone or. A robot it's possible an idea. Or? Yes, uh, we don't have any positive evidence anyway. These are conjectures mostly, but the, the some of the evidence is available for examination. Is what I the main thing I wanted mm -hmm. to mention here. From where uh, about how many of these these beings extraterrestrial for lack of a, probably a better term how many have been a actually examined um, as far as uh, some classified and unclassified material gotten through the army and the air force there's approximately 30 to 40 uh, bodies in the United States. Uh, now we also have to take into consideration that there are other governments, uh, primarily European and uh, from what I understand also the Soviet Union has them also. And, uh, and we don't really know how many they have. Uh, mm. We do know that uh, there are, uh, at one time there were bodies uh, of a crash disc uh, off the uh, coast of Germany and also uh, one that crashed in England uh, which uh, uh, belongs technically to the Swedish government and uh, Russia of course uh, is, has at least 20 that, uh, mm -hmm. that China, Communist China has uh, indicated that they have a crash disk also uh, that they've studied the bodies that crashed someplace in the Gobi area you know it, it seems like things seem to be coming to a head more and more. Uh, apparently we've reached a point where it's not like they showed up in the 14th century and said well there's not much we can do with these humans right now on these earth people and might observe for a while and take off. We seem to have reached a point where there's not too much farther we might be able to go to before before a real disaster could occur. Uh, does it seem uh, any of you, Elsie, uh, Stevens, or Martin, does it, have you heard anything at all that would indicate that they might interfere, they could interfere, they feel they should interfere? Or if, if it comes to this one last thing, yes, a question? Well, no, I have a statement. According to the uh, Solar Cross information, you know, beings of higher intelligence view our Earth and our Sun and our solar system as more or less like an atomic structure. And they view our galaxy as like a cellular structure. They view our universe as just a part of a larger entity of some sort that's viewing its own universe. As, as we are looking out on the stars within ourselves, our own cellular structure and atomic structure also has universes and worlds going on. And time in relation to mass and the blink of the eye of the larger entity that we're a part of, millenniums go on here and in the blink of our own eye, millenniums occur within our own bodily systems. And that if we do, uh, if we do get to the point of self-destruction, that we will, like within our own system, if we start an atomic uh, malfunction within ourselves, we have immunity systems that serve to eliminate it. And that if we start an atomic malfunction within the galaxies that we're a part of, the immunity systems of the larger being that we're a part of may serve to not only eliminate us, but the solar system of the galaxy that we're a part of, and that that is one of the cosmic laws where they have the right to interfere. Well, that's a good argument. That's the best way I've heard it expressed. But, it, yeah, there is some indication that we won't be allowed to destroy our Earth. We can destroy all the life on it, but destroying the Earth may have bigger consequences, and there are some indications from some cases, I'm not sure that's in the Palladian case, that oh, yes. some interference would take place to prevent that degree of destruction. We won't be able to blow it up. What we want to say? Uh, well, if uh, it is going to um, uh, destruct although the system mm -hmm. out, it may be that then the Pleiadians would interfere. It may be. Mm -hmm. But uh, the first thing now, instead of thinking, what would they do when? Mm -hmm. We have to try hard before. To reverse the process so we don't get into that situation. We shouldn't be trying to destroy our world. Tell me, uh, you know, is there anything you'd like to add, Martin, before? Uh, yes, uh, to Please. the question that you were asking before uh, the theory was uh, was brought in, what can be done or what uh, what is being done um, about the aliens and uh, why isn't anything happening. Uh, 
first of all, the aliens have made themselves as known as possible. I mean, our government knows about it in a very hush-hush way. I mean, you can't walk up to the average person and ask them. Uh, people like Billy Meyer and what have you, or Mr. Meyer, have, um, have the information at hand if we're willing to look at it. But one thing that's always uh, puzzled me and what have you, that all the contacts and people that have been given contacts have never been given any type of uh, collateral or money to do what they're supposed to do. For instance, Mr. Meyer is supposed to publish, but yet they don't give him the money to publish. Um, these um, humanoid bodies and what have you, that we know that they have, the discs that we know that they have, and people have sacrificed themselves by landing here telling us that they are there, why don't we look and try and investigate and scientifically analyze it? But yet, we can't because every time we try, we're either stopped by the government or some unknown uh, person or what have you, and uh, it's just a big stymie. And unfortunately, uh, until we can get around the secrecy of the government and realize uh, you know, that they are real, then maybe we can help our technology, our science, and our biological science uh, to a better advancement. Right. General Stevens, there is something I'd like to ask you before it slips me. You said that many of these sounds that were, uh, that have emanated from these flying discs were, we are incapable of reproducing uh, with Earth, Earth's technology. What is it, the frequency yeah. or the... No, we can't, we can't produce the whole sound. We can take any segment of it and reproduce it with synthesizers. In the case of the Meyer case, of the Meyer experience, there are 32 separate tones being simultaneously emitted. That would take eight synthesizers and four mixers, costing a total of about a quarter of a million dollars to do. We can make any straight segment, but we can't make the segment vary in amplitude because we don't have any amplitude varying equipment in, in electronics. We can't band lock the frequencies to change all of the amplitudes simultaneously. We can change frequencies simultaneously because we have frequency control devices. But we don't, we're not able to do more than make a straight segment of sound. And what we have recorded is, is a fluctuating sound with a beat to it. So, yes, we cannot reproduce the sounds that Billy Meyer recorded. We can reproduce any straight segment of it in synthesizers if you want to spend a quarter of a million dollars to do so. Anything you'd like to add, Elsie? I only hope, I mean, just that in the future people will have open minds to listen to this and to also to listen to the teaching. It seems like going back to some of the ancient, for us, from for humanity, ancient teachings, maybe some of the, the ancient Tibetan teachings or Chinese or even the yogic teachings, uh, might be a key for us, a key that leads us to a more natural way of living, a less, a less uh, yes. yes, I think uh, people have forgotten about the, the, the um, basic teaching, teaching if they wouldn't have been twisting it up and keep it inside in them, uh, I think we would be more developed yet. Where will it all end? <laughs> uh, I want to thank you all for your time and your energy and what you've given. For, for Elsie and Colonel Stevens and for Martin. Uh, again, one last thing anyone would want to say? I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Well, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your time. We haven't come that far. Well, you, you've traveled much further than we have. We've only come from California. You've come from Switzerland. Oh, I love it here. I think, like being home. Good. Yeah. Well, you may be because you may be visited tonight or something. <laughs> okay. All right, let's see what we get up and go to the sounds. Okay, here's a here's a, a, a photograph taken by Mil Billy Meyer. It's number 200 in his album. Uh, okay. One moment. Okay, here's one of the photographs uh, taken by Mil Billy Meyer in Switzerland. This is picture number 200 in his album. And here we show a contact print from the original 35 millimeter transparency. Uh, this is of uh, uh, the third variation spacecraft and when we print this contact print directly on into a print we get this image here. That's the sharpness that we get. Uh, then it, we took this image and to a, a commercial 
photography shop and had it custom enlarged from a transparency to a 35 to a four inch by five inch inter negative then we made this print from the inter negative this is a contact print from the inter negative you'll see it's a little bit sharper than the print from the original transparency what we've done here is transferred the depth in the small transparency to depth again in a larger negative the negative will pick up the depth that the paper will not so then we took the 4x5 inter negative to an electronic scanner put it through the machine and made four separate color separation negatives the scanner scans 400 lines per centimeter horizontally and vertically and simultaneously creates four separate color negatives for plates then we took those plates to a printer and had them printed on the poster paper and developed this much detail out of the same picture where initially we couldn't see the detail you can see a gold band around the top you can see the shape of the top and everything else now that spacecraft the sounds of that spacecraft were recorded on another date uh, as a swiss army mirage jet fighter made 22 passes on the ship and here's the recorded sound that's this ship over another location on another date when it was pursued by a jet fighter, and there you just heard the jet fighter go through. What is happening now, Billy? Uh, there is coming an airplane from the Swiss Air Force. Okay, we can hear the airplane in the background coming in. It's being vectored in on aircraft. She has put up the shield and also turned off all sound. There the jet fighter goes through again. Somebody phones to the army because the whistling of the ship must be hearing uh, around a very big area. Yeah. Somebody must have phoned the military. Perhaps someone saw it and phoned it. At least they could have heard it. there making the noise. 